So I just went down to the thrift store, just, you know, to kill some time. And didn't think there'd be much. Electronics is usually fairly questionable. But I found this. And given that it's a bit banged up, $10 was a bit high. But I plugged it in and the display works. And I think that might be vacuum fluorescent. My guess, given when Proton was a big deal, is that this is probably from the early to mid-90s. Um, it is analog. When I plugged it in, I don't think the backlight on the radio worked. I'll we'll try that in a second. This was my last significant haul, this little TAC from like 2006 or something like that. That just needs a new battery and a little bit of cleaning up. That sounds great. That was TX brief entry in the tabletop radio wars of the early 2000s. Uh, which then died once uh, once uh, everybody decided they needed Bluetooth and everything. So, yeah, well, that's that's great. It sounds really good. It's it's a ported box. It was designed by someone who cares. The radio receiver is pretty good as an FM receiver, but AM it kind of likes to hold on to strong stations and uh, has relatively poor selectivity, unfortunately. But Works fine, sounds nice. Me and I guess used for listening to FM, of course. So I'm quite interested in this thing though. I mean, I don't think there's, the cases aren't broken, so I think it's just been clunked down. I think a little clean up and uh, take the cover off and put it back together and that should solve that. And then the question, next question would be the backlight for the display. I'll just plug this in here. Let's see if I can manage that we get yeah i don't think it's vacuum fluorescent i think that's a little good look once it's inside i think that's probably led but if you turn on the radio you get the tuning light the lighted indicator Anyway, so as you can see, the radio works. We just, I just need to get the backlight going. Um, we got two alarms. I can put on AM. I haven't tried AM out. I mean, this is a very deep, noisy corner. So what we get on AM is. Um, we might have to have a look at some of the capacitors in there, but I mean, I'm not tempted to play with it very much, but yeah, you know, you got radio on and off, we have got two alarms, snooze button, something under here, which I don't know what it is, oh, that's the sleep. Oh, that sets the sleep timer. I see. Buttons around the back, I believe, for setting the, the time and the, uh, and peace and trouble. But, you know, this is a pretty analog device. So, I don't know, though. I'm looking at the difference in colors on that display. I think it might be vacuum fluorescent, which push, definitely pushes it into the early 90s. Let's have, have a good look. Do we see any of the wires? Uh, not without my glasses anyway, but it does look like vacuum fluorescent to me. If it's if it goes back into the 80s, this is a, uh, in my view, a bit of a find because Proton was quite a big deal in the late 80s. This was the stuff that was advertised in, you know, the Borgie magazines out of New York and and whatnot, and kind of at the same time, you know, when, when this whole sort of market was was uh, was growing. Anyway, a um, little bit I listened to it on FM, it sounds pretty good, and it's a pretty big chunky thing, it's got a pretty big transformer in it for sure. So uh, yeah, well, it's going to be fun to, to play with this. Okay, well I'm getting impatient, so I'm going to have a look at the uh, at the inside and see if at least I can get the case straight. I did try it up here, the getting away from the 
kitchen and its noisy and low signal environment did improve the reception. I still think that there's a bit of noise hum in the background on the FM. I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if that's the amplifier power supply capacitors. That seems like the most likely culprit, but I don't know if I want to get into it too much because, well, it gets out of my skill set a bit and, um, easy enough to make things worse than it is. It is vacuum fluorescent. I did look it up. It looks like this model dates from the mid eighties and was one of the sort of early protons. So that sort of made their mark and sort of hit the first wave of the sort of table radio period. So, and I also read that apparently they still go for 50 bucks on eBay. So I'm thinking that the $10 may actually have been a pretty good deal for it. So I'm gonna get it open, see if I can get the case together. If I see anything inside, I will take some video of that. So here's the inside. Um, I was able to snap the case back together, but that revealed a problem, and that's that this standoff, which is you know very nicely molded into the plastic, nice brass that machine screws go into, has broken off inside there. So well, that might be possible to epoxy that on. I think that's what I'm going to try. Um, I do note, no, obviously bad capacitors. It's definitely a vacuum fluorescent screen. That's probably a driver for it down there would be my guess, but who knows? There's the radio dial. It's not immediately apparent where the backlight the bulb is, but maybe that'll become apparent when I look around the side. Oh, oh no, that's a screw. And there's the radio cord running through. Well, it's probably just hanging out the back there somewhere. I would have thought around the top. They're often on the top, but I don't think so here. The display is in great shape. The uh, little dimming, which is controlled by this photocell, as you can see, let's see, right there where that photo cell works perfectly. And I suspect that's why it's in good shape because it spent a lot of its time dimmed. And the brightness is pretty good. I mean, it's just what I remember from these sorts of things in that era. Uh, the speaker, oh look, that's got a plug. I didn't notice that before. That would make things more convenient. Anyway, I'll have a quick look, see if I can find uh, a, uh, a bulb that's easy to replace if possible. If not, I mean, my feeling is that I will probably just glue that back and put it back together. This, you, know, you can see the foam around the buttons has deteriorated as it tends to, but it's pretty clean inside and nothing wrong with it. It just looks like it's been dropped and having a big chunky transformer and a very large speaker magnet on it. Um, Presumably that's the that's the output transistors. One, two, looks like just one for the uh, for the amplifier. I don't know. I get a bit outside my expertise here, but uh, yeah, I think I think the third trick with this will be to do as little as possible and. Uh, and, and see how it goes. Okay, here's the dial light, just down, let's see, down there. It looks like it's, you know, focus on the right thing, okay. Uh, just have to figure out how to get it out, I suppose, and then see if we can get a, a new lamp for it. And so that's on the dial light, and it had this little, Let's see if I can get it into view. This little green um, silicone, I don't know, it looks like tip of a medicine dropper or I don't know, something like that, which it was sort of stuffed up down, down this, uh, this metal on the side. So it is side lit. That probably gives it a bit of the green glow that we, to match the vacuum fluorescent display. I guess just check the continuity on that bulb, cut away the 
and cut away the uh, heat shrink there and see if it's good. And if it is good, obviously, then the problem's somewhere else. But most likely, the lamp is bad, and it'll just be a question of figuring out what it is. There's the little lamp. It's got no markings on it that I can see. It was surprisingly difficult to get this uh, heat shrink off without cutting oneself with a dangerous exacto knife. But I succeeded. There is no continuity across the lamp. Without any markings, I'm not sure what voltage it operates on. Um, I have no idea if I, what what, uh, what it might in something like this. So what I would guess I will do is plug in the radio, turn it on, and see if I can measure the voltage across the lamp, in which case then it's just a question of measuring the lamp and obtaining one that's the same size, or slightly smaller would work too. Well, after much futzing around, I managed to read 14 and a half volts or so on it, so it's a 12 volt automotive lamp of some sort. So that will make it relatively easy to replace, assuming I can find one. Anyway, I'm gonna measure it, take a note, and uh, and then try gluing that case and uh, and come back to it when I when I have a lamp. There is also something that smells a bit warm in here, but this could also be just dust on some component. So not too concerned about it yet. I do note that that main power supply capacitor. There's some black glue under there. The cap looks fine. It's a Micon, it's a, like name brand capacitor as far as I know, which is not that much. Um, but if that capacitor is bad, that probably is an explanation for well, some of the hum that seems there in the, uh, uh, in there. So I don't know. Um, I will have a look, but at the moment I really don't feel terribly inclined to take things apart much more. This thing is quite fiddly to, to put together, I think. I'm not sure quite how, how replaceable some of that stuff is going to be. So yeah, I think, I think I'll fix the lamp and, and, and glue that piece back on the case and see if I can get the whole thing together and working as it is, and then if it needs something else, I can try to get back into it. That's the plan. Okay, well here's another look at the Proton Radio. Um, I didn't video any of it, but uh, I uh, went through and replaced the lamp in the dial light with, a, with an LED, and that's worked quite well. I've also done a very, very straightforward, very slight wipe down of it, which clears, cleans up the case a lot and makes it look pleasanter. Um, I did find another crack in it. That's probably gluable. And I have ordered a capacitor for the power supply in this, but the dial looks very nice. The radio, apart from, oh, it's already on, I turned it down. A little bit of hum sounds very good. So my guess is that capacitor will solve the problem. Okay, my capacitors have arrived, so it's now time to open up this radio and see uh, and see if I can get it in place and also fix a few more of these. I don't know if that one's worth fixing. Little cracks on the case. There's another one in the top case that definitely could use glue. You can see that it's lost the labels and that one's all bleached away. Yeah. The other thing I noticed just the other day is that there's some paint on the cord, although not on the body of the radio at all. So, yeah, as I said, garage radio. So this is the capacitor I want to replace here. Um, it looks like the whole, I don't know, is chassis the proper word when it's just a bunch of circuit boards, but I think 
that screw there, there are a couple down here, and there's one in the corner here. I'm hopeful that I'll be able to take the whole thing apart. Um, the problem that I'm concerned with is, as you can see uh, right here, that that's the dial cord that comes in and actually goes through the board down there. And I think the chances of me getting that together are slim to none if I, uh, if I have to remove this board here. So, yeah, so I'm hoping that since that capacitor is on the bottom board, it looks like one, two, hopefully there isn't anything else hidden in there, um, that hopefully if I get, the, get this whole chassis or whatever one wants to call it out, then, uh, then that'll work. We'll see. So here it is. Here's the dial cord that I was talking about. That's actually a reasonably neat design. Everything looks pretty good. Everything's working great on that. Um, there's the back of the board. And yeah, the whole thing comes out. It was four screws, I believe. And then there was this little board, which has the switches from the back, which are interesting. And that's the mode switch for uh, for setting the tuning mode, or the the the, uh, the clock setting mode, I mean. Yeah, so that's that. So the capacitor I'm looking for is right here. Um, and we can see which the negative side is right there. So I'm gonna put a black dot and a red dot on that. And then I'm gonna desolder it and put in one of these fancy audio grade ones that I bought. So there is the new capacitor in place. It was fairly straightforward. I don't own a solder sucker, so I had to make do with solder grade, which was fine for this, because you could wiggle it out uh, one pin at a time easily enough. Now, here's the old one. There's another new one. I tested the new one with the meter just to see, and it says 22.2, which is correct, given that it's a 22 microfarad capacitor. If I test this one, I don't know if I can do this. And of course, I've checked the other lead on the floor, but let's see if it's possible for me to measure this one. This is, makes my limited chopstick skills help. Okay, I'm going to put this down. So there we go. I have it, I think. And now we go over here. No, no I don't have it. Let's try again. All right. Two point two six which is 2200 microfarad. So, I mean, it tests okay, but something's clearly been leaking here and there's all the components beside it seem all right. I think it's leaked out of the bottom down here. The top's still good and it feels very light. Now, mind you, this is a 35 volts and this is a, you know, fancier capacitor. Although, you know, so we'll see, um, but I'm thinking that the reason it's so light is that there isn't much electrolyte in it anymore. So I don't have an ESR meter. Um, I do have one of those little component testers. I suppose I could put it in that. Well, maybe once I've got this reassembled, I'll give that a try. Uh, for reassembly, it's, uh, it's gonna be a little complex. I did do a little bit of uh, gluing and on some of the little cracks where it had been dropped in the chassis. So I'm hoping that helps a little bit. But uh, you know, my guess is that is that this is going to get rid of the residual hum. Okay, so here it is back together. There's that new capacitor. I note that it, like the old one, is sitting right above the power transformer, which does 
make a fair bit of heat in this radio. So I, th I think we could probably understand why it failed. And possibly one of the causes for these things to apparently often being in non-working condition when people get them after 30 whatever years. So I would say that's probably a pretty good likely cause for it. There's no obvious place one could move it to as the speaker sits in right here. So I don't know. I, I don't intend to find out. I've got six of them. So if it goes again, it's just enough to replace. So what I think I'm going to do is just plug it in to see if it powers on and then uh, wait until I've got the case assembled before I try the speaker out in it. Okay, so we've got a clock. And I do notice something different already. So I was noticing when I pressed alarm two that it would flash and jump around. And now it's nice and solid, just like alarm one was. I thought that was because the button might be dirty and I haven't touched it. I was wondering whether I should get some deoxit, which I had, but I have no idea where it went. Uh, but I notice it's fine now, and none of the pots on this feel bad, I've got to say. They all seem really good. So there's the capacitor, and there's the transformer, and uh, I'm, I'm quite excited. I will try the buttons on the back, which, of course, I had to take off just to make sure they work before I go any farther. So here's the uh, tester. I think everybody owns one of these. Okay, yeah, I didn't have it in the little thing properly. So, the test says 2200 microfarad. It gives a loss number, and it does give an ESR number of zero. Well, that's interesting. Let's take this out. Let's see if we can clone this in some way or another. Okay, let's try again. Okay, it got it as 1300 microfarads V loss. The ESR is 19 ohms. So I think we can say first, it doesn't meet its specifications, even though interestingly, the multimeter did test it as correct. Uh, but uh, it's certainly um, no good. <laughs> so I'm going to transfer that battery back to this radio in a few minutes, and I'm going to put this in place as my bedside table radio for a little while before deciding whether that's where it stays or whether it goes to the office or something like that. But I'm quite pleased with this. I think for $10, that's a pretty good deal, given that, uh, I mean, it's a bit rough, but now it's fixed. And I also had noticed as I was poking about looking at these online is that most of them are said to be non-working. And given the positioning of that uh, power supply capacitor right over the transformer, which cooks pretty hot, I do wonder if uh, if that's a common mode of failure for these. The other things that seems seems to come up are dial lights. That was, by the way, very easy to fix. I'm sorry I didn't film that, but I measured the voltage on that line on the bulb at 14.5 volts. It was very hard to get it the multimeter on. It might have been a bit lower. It might have been a bit higher. Uh, so I, my guess is that if you put in a 12 volt automotive bulb, which is, you know, really a 13, 13 and a half volt bulb, that it would be fine. But what I did, because I didn't have one of those and didn't feel like going hunting around for it, is I figured, okay, 14 and a half volts, let's put in a, a white LED and a, uh, and a 1K resistor. You know, a 1 or a 1.1K resistor should be good. That should give you about 10 milliamps on the LED. Uh, a warm white one, I think there's a little filter on it, and I think a warm white one would have matched the color of the dial a little bit, the vacuum fluorescent display here a little bit more closely than this does. I, they probably look very close on the video anyway. But uh, um, I did not have a warm white LED in the appropriate size. 
a dolly won't take a big one it takes a it takes a small one um, and uh, so that's what I used and a 1k resistor turned out to be right near the top of the pile of resistors so that's what I used as well um, but again you know the back of the envelope calculation suggests that that should be fine uh, at 14 and a half volts and my guess is that it's actually a little lower so uh, yeah, I, I would say a lot of these radios out there, I would bet, could be fixed by just doing those two things. It just like seems like two likely modes of failure. I'll say that the, the, the guts of it, as it were, since I couldn't decide whether you can call it a chassis when it isn't a chassis, but um, the, the uh, come out quite easily. So you can get around to the other side and replace the capacitor very easily. Uh, I suppose if you didn't want to do that, you could somehow try to cut the, pull the leads out or something and and stick one in. But I, you know, it's really easy to get out. It was it was no hassle at all. And uh, yeah, my guess is a lot of these could be fixed and made working um, without too much trouble. My guess is that the, the failure that will that will kill it in the long run will be the vacuum fluorescent display. But this one seems nice and strong. All right, well, that's sort of the first project I've tried to do any filming of, and, uh, you know, it seemed like a fun thing to do, and hopefully someone likes to hear about it. I should say I am about the least expert person when it comes to this stuff. Uh, you'll see, but, you know, a little poking and a little idea from watching other videos and from reading other sources about what does fail and these sorts of things um, seems to go a long way. Uh, this, I think, is a lot safer to work on than any uh, than any older equipment. I don't think there's any exposed, you know, AC power, well, mains power anyway, in here at all. Uh, it looks like there are uh, crimp connectors that go to the cord, and that's about it. I've got to say, I didn't take the little board off there. It's all hot glued in place. So that's a nice 1980s radio and nice working condition makes me happy because I quite wanted one of these in the 80s when I was a teenager, so uh, I appreciate having one now. So here's the Proton Radio in its current spot on my bedside table with, you know, the usual junk that tends to live in such a spot. Um, I wanted to add that I did one more thing, which was to look up the chip, um, a TI chip, which you can see in some of the internal videos, and it is just to see what it is. And what it is, is it's a one chip clock radio solution. That is, it provides all the clock functions. The rest of this radio is it's essentially an analog um, radio, an amplifier, I suppose. The, 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 the clock is entirely on that single chip, and it's a very interesting chip. It's got a couple of things. It's got, um, it, it use, it's an AC electric clock, so it's using the AC line cycle as the timekeeper. Now, there are good reasons for that. An AC-driven clock, an electric clock, will never lose or gain time because the number of cycles in a day is a defined constant, right? So it will not gain or lose time at all. It may not be accurate second to second as the line cycle changes, but as long as it's counting those uh, the sine waves correctly, it will never gain or lose time, which is a pretty convenient thing in a bedside clock. It does have a battery backup, and I've always wondered, you know, why is the battery backup so bad in clock radios from the 80s? And the reason for that is that's not a quartz clock either. That's using a, an onboard oscillator to provide a short-term time, um, time standard. So, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not a quartz clock. It's just a very short-term solution. And my experience is, if they, is it will gain or lose minutes if the power's out for a few hours. And not with this one, but with, you know, the clock radios that I grew up with. So that's really very interesting, I, I think, and it's a very neat chip. Um, not much else to add about this. I, I really like the device. I think it's I think it's quite nice, and I think that the repair has been more than adequate to make it workable, if not if not terribly pretty.